back at you at Gloves Off, and today we have one of the pillars of our community, State Representative Richard Raymond. Good to see you, man. <laughs> Good to be with you. Um, Tell us a little bit about what's going on. I know we've well, been hit with several yeah, disasters, disasters yeah. and yeah. horrific actions. And then this month just started, and we got hit with a horrific action of terrorism yesterday. But let's talk about what you've been doing, what you're bringing. Well, to you know, state. everybody, of course, is familiar with the, the terrible hurricanes that we've had, especially Harvey, as far as Texas. Correct. And, uh, you know, I'm very thankful uh, that it didn't affect us in Laredo um, in, in any measurable way. I'm, I'm also very proud that there were so many Laredoans that wanted to help and who have helped people that were affected. Some of them actually have relatives uh, along the coast, business associates, just friendships, whatever. I mean, it's a sm this world is becoming smaller and smaller. You know more people that, exactly. that don't live in your town but that live uh, far away. And so I was very proud the way this community stepped up and, and we've helped so much. Uh, but it also got me to thinking as I watched things unfold that we can always do things better. And, um, in which ways? Well, you know, the mayor of Houston is a very good friend of mine, Sylvester Turner. We served together for many years in the House before he ran for mayor a couple of years ago. He's a good man. Uh, I didn't like the way it, uh, they were criticizing him, saying, oh, you know, the, some of the press, well, why didn't you vacate or, you know, mandatory evacuation. That's a very hard thing to do in a city of over five million people, six, whatever it is now. And, uh, and you have to be very careful with that because it can cause a stampede. I can remember the last time they tried that several years ago and a lot of people died because of that. And so you have to be very careful about it. But what I, I realized is that we at the state level need to do more when we have these types of disasters. It is a disaster. In that case, it was a natural disaster. But there are man-made disasters as well. And so um, I wrote up a bill. I sat down. I talked to the DPS director. The Department of Public Safety has the Emergency Management Division. They run right. the Emergency Management Division. That's where Amber Alert and everybody else. So yes, yeah, so we have the alert system. Within that, we have the alert system. The Amber Alert, which most people I think are familiar with, when a child goes missing. The Silver Alert, when a uh, a senior, uh, you know, may have Alzheimer's or something, starts driving well, off and gets right. lost. Uh, the Blue Alert, when there's a very dangerous person out there, bas basically killing people, like the shootings in Dallas, where they ended up. We didn't know at the, at the time immediately that the target was police officers. Exactly. But it was. Uh, but that kind of situation is called the blue alert, where you let people know don't go to downtown Dallas. People are getting shot right now. Uh, and then we have the endangered missing persons uh, alert, which is uh, someone to, that maybe has uh, intellectual or developmental disabilities. Um, they are lost. They don't know what to do. Um, so we have those alerts. So my bill would add another alert to it, and I call it the disaster alert. And again, natural or man-made disasters. And I thought about the man-made part because here in Laredo, while I've been state rep, I can remember several times where we have gotten uh, bomb threats at the bridges, where somebody calls it, hey, I put a bomb on the bridge. And that's a big deal. A lot of people get hurt, and it can affect our community. Uh, thank goodness that uh, nothing is, has... They were has, false? Yeah, nothing has happened up to now. but. In today's world, anything like that could happen. So, you know, the bill that I put forth that I've got ready, I've already written it up, would establish the disaster alert so that we have, for the first time, something coming from the from state government. We at the state level, the Department of Public Safety, Division of Emergency Management, is getting information from uh, FEMA, is getting information from NOAA, uh, National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric, Atmospheric Administration. Uh, telling us about, you know, the development of hurricanes, etc., or tornadoes, or whatever. Getting information, putting it out to the public, coming from an official authority that can get it statewide. And some people would say, well, it's a hurricane, why would we need to know in Laredo? Well, you need to know because you may have relatives there. And if you know about it, you can't say, primo, Hey, yeah, come it's on a four, over. Her, yeah. yeah. You know what? Get over here for the weekend. Start preparing. Start, start preparing, etc. You know, I I, uh, I chair the Human Services Committee. I have oversight over all the Medicaid programs in Texas, Health and Human Services. I bet you Commission. that was affected. Absolutely, uh, and and so for example, I have oversight on all the nursing homes. We had over a nurse, a hundred nursing homes. I don't even know exactly what it was. Over a hundred of them that had to be evacuated from the Beaumont, Houston, Victoria. Uh, areas, even okay, Corpus Christi. Where do where did they take all of them? Did well, they, I, 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 you know, they they moved them to other nursing homes that that were close enough that would that would have capacity. 
or they tried to get in touch with you know relatives that were away from the from the areas that were being hit and say look we're going to have to move them there but unfortunately and some of them because they didn't have enough notice i mean they're moving them after the place has already been flooded so you'll see pictures of, of senior citizens in their in their wheelchairs or, or, or somebody who's disabled or some people who's in, who are nursing homes and the water's up to their knees or up to their waist well if they i think if they had had more notice leading up to it paul then you could make a, a better decision about saying you know what hey we've got a tia that lives in houston she's in a nursing home what we're seeing the notice we're getting from the emergency system the the the, the uh, you know the emergency notification on disasters is that it looks like it's going to be pretty bad and it gives other nursing homes in the area time to prepare to bring in influx exactly of, of, uh, that's the other thing that the, the other. That, that the nursing homes themselves in this case they would be getting information going you know we don't have the capacity we don't have the ability we don't have emergency generators whatever so they're making more informed decisions so i think it's something that uh, i feel confident we're going to pass it i've already talked to a lot of legislators i can't believe we hadn't thought about it before we have the emergency alert system we just didn't have one for disasters i think what this has shown us is we have to we have one, one. and we because we already have the system i don't think it's going to cost us anything to be honest with you i don't think it's going to cost anything to, to add now disaster alert to the other four alerts and one that will save a lot of lives and some, something else that we can interject into that you know yeah. um, i have a lot of students that are dps yes they were all moved towards rockport and corpus christi and so on and so forth yeah. and um, yeah. they come back and they say you know we had to turn people away because they were bringing in food but everything was getting rotten and so on and so forth that can also help well that's aid. a great point paul that's a great point because for example then dps will coordinate with local communities and say all right and they put it out on the alert you put right. it on the disaster alert and everybody gets on their phones and everything said if you want to donate food supplies this is the blankets, distribution center here and you're going to go to rockport this is where it's going to be you're going to go to houston these are the five locations you're going to go to beaumont this, this is where it is so you know it's things like that we're, we're finding out now as a result of this uh, terrible event is that there are a lot of things that we could do and so we need to implement that it, it's again it should not cost anything uh, because we're just getting information disseminating it but it's coming from an official source that will be responsible and so that right. people don't have to just look at you know cnn or fox or whatever and say what are they saying on tv no, no, no. This is because, look, let's, so, let's yeah. face it let's face it reporters uh, they're going to try to sensationalize. Of course, they're not going to be. Course. They're not going to be like, well, this is that. Is this exactly right? No, they're going to. They're going to build it up, and they're going to. Well, and and for and that's what you don't want. You don't want misinformation. Exactly right. And so the D DPS. I mean, that's our. That's chief, official enough. That's our chief law enforcement agency. They're going to be very conscientious about it. They're not going to put something out to the public, without making sure. Okay, this is solid information. Yeah, you know what? If you if you have diabetes if you there's another one uh, people that um, that do a dialysis they had a lot of problems in the houston area if people that needed dialysis they didn't they know where to take them where you well that's a serious now? deal you, you'll die if you don't you know if you have to do dialysis you don't do it so things like that if you if you are diabetic and you have to do dialysis we, we recommend that you move to higher ground it's unfortunate that when we have a disaster yeah that it brings everybody together yeah okay we should always be together, okay, um, regardless of political views. True. But once we come, once heads come together, stuff like this emerges. Emer right, right. And uh, good ideas are developed. Mm -hmm. And it always happens, you know, since... Absolutely. Since... 9-11. Uh, Remember 9 when 9-11, yeah. when that happened, we so all everybody came So everybody came together and said, you know what, we have to end this. There's a problem here. Let's fix it. And... And well, I'm glad it's, it's, you're standing up and going forward. Well, it's like you you told before we started, as you mentioned. You know, when we get into these positions, um, there are certainly some things we're going to disagree on. Of course. But but I always tell people, look, I'm a very strong Democrat. Uh, some of my best friends are Republicans. I work very hard with Republicans in the legislature, and and uh, some of the freshman Democrats toward the end of the session, like last time, they said, "How do you get along with the Republicans so well?" I said, "Well, look, I mean." We're going to disagree on some things, but there's so many things that we can agree on. And I said, and if the people I love the most in the world, okay, I have had some major disagreements with, my parents, my brother, my sister, my wife, my kids. If the people I love the most I have had disagreements with, it's natural. It's going to happen. 
but you work on other things, and so you make things, you build out of it. You should always stop and think. What look? This is about making Texas a better place, and it is, and the United States a better place. When you start from that common ground, which I really try to do, um, it, let me tell you a, a story. So one night we were debating very late in the legislature in the House, and it got too personal, it got too nasty, and I didn't like it. Of course, it was about one in the morning, and I have found out you really should not be debating at one in the morning on microphones because that's just not the time to be debating. You're tired and all, but it got it got kind of personal. I didn't like it. So next morning, you know, we start every morning with an opening prayer. And, and I sit, my desk in the floor of the house is very close to the front where the speaker is. And so the next morning, uh, we had a priest come in and do the opening prayer. And it was a very good prayer, very moving. And I'm sitting there, standing there rather, my hands clasped and my eyes closed. And I thought, you know, God, I wish we could come together more often like we are in this moment, just to remind us of our common purpose. I wish there was something I could do to, to, to bring that about or to help it. The prayer's over. I open my eyes, I look at the speaker, and then I look up above the speaker, and above the speaker on the wall is just a big white space. And I look at it, and I think, in God we trust. The words are not up there. And I have to thank God put that in my brain. Who else would have, right? I looked at it and I said, in God we trust. What, what have we put in God we trust up there? So I went and researched, you know, it's, of course I know it's our national motto. It has been for a long, long time, basically since the Civil War. Of course. Nobody had ever introduced a bill to put in God we trust in the Capitol. So I wrote up the bill, and it took me a while for dumb reasons, but it took me a while, and I finally got it passed. And you walk into the House chamber, and the words in God we trust are up there. I think it helps. It reminds us, again, of our common purpose. And every so often, when it gets kind of nasty or people are getting... I get on the microphone, and I say, we put those words in God we trust up here, members, just to remind us that we're here for a common purpose. If you want to disagree... It's okay to disagree. Let's do it respectfully. Uh, you're, you're absolutely correct. Once insults go into a conversation, yeah, you know, there's mirth and so on and so forth, and we can joke around. And there's banter. Yeah. That's, that's okay. Yeah. We all do that. Yeah. But once an insult starts, everything shuts off. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Then so, you're blind. You know, you're blinded. You're blinded. So a lot of folks, you know, get blinded right away. Too quickly. Too quickly. And uh, in this world now, and before we, you know, we didn't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody would just laugh about most. But now, you, for whatever thing you do, now everything's an insult. And I think we have to kind of get back and say, hey, wait a minute, we all live together, man. Yeah. And it's and okay. Hey, it's way okay way to, you know, to get around. You want, hey, man, you want friends that'll joke around with you, you know, and... You know, the best, you know, friend, the best friend, excuse me for yeah. interrupting, the best friend is the one that's going to tell you, hey, you know what, Paul? You're screwing up, man. Yeah. That, that's not, not the guy that says, oh, you're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> you're doing awesome. You're the first one up. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You want the guy to say, you know what? Absolutely. Hey, listen. Quit, quit messing like, up. Like, like my best, you know, I grew up I grew up in Benavides. Sure. I've come to Laredo all my life. My family's here, of course, and I love Laredo. Um, but I grew up in Benavides, 70 miles that way, a little town, town of 1,600 people. My best friend, Heriberto Carabajal, we would call him Boy. That was his name. He, he passed away two years ago. But he started, you know, drinking when we were in high school. And I wouldn't drink, man. I wouldn't drink anything. I just didn't. And... Um, I said, dude, if you're going to drink, you got to let me drive. I said, you can't. I, 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 yeah, I didn't try to tell him don't drink because, hey, that's his deal, man. I'm not going to yeah. try to. But I, and he would never, by the way, he would never try to make me drink, which, yeah, I, very much, which I very much appreciated. Never. He wouldn't, hey, come on, man, drink. No. Nah. And so instead of getting mad at me, he said, yeah, you're right. So, you know, he had an old beat-up Chevy Impala. You know, I didn't have anything. And so when we would go somewhere, if he started drinking, you go, hey, you drive. So instead of getting mad at me, he like, yeah, man, you drive, you know. Yeah, that's, that's, that's just the way, that's a, that's just the way it is. You yeah. know, something about we we live in a culture here, let alone you. And then we're 15, 16 years old, and your uncle were tell you, I'd rather for you to drink a beer here than go out there and yeah. drink a beer in the street. Yeah, okay, so yeah exactly. Pick up a beer for you know, and <laughs> later on, and then you played with a beer for the, about two hours and so on and so forth. But, yeah. but that right there helped me because when I went off to college. Yeah. Yeah. Kids that never drank. You know, at, I was eight. I was you know, I was eighteen years old, and you can drink. Yeah. When yeah. I was twenty, they made, they moved it to twenty one. Oh yeah. Okay. Remember so. Yeah. yeah. That, that, That's uh, true. So I was like, okay. Um, but when when I was eighteen, you can drink. You get people that never drank. Yeah. Making fools of themselves and DUIs and so on, left and right. And you were the only one there sitting down looking at <laughs> up. Thing I was like, 
thank you, my tíos, for for pushing that and not pushing that yeah. into us. You know, yeah, that exactly. kind of <laughs> But uh, we have great laws to protect our youth from not drinking. Yes. Um, and we got to do more on that, man. I got to tell you, we we've just got to be vigilant about it. I I will tell you, it was a little bit of a controversy uh, about Uber, and it's yeah. not just Uber. Uber is only one of the companies. There's Lyft, yeah, and there there are other others. companies. But I, I, uh, I voted for, last session, we had to, to uh, deal with legislation that would allow those companies basically to have played by the same rules statewide. So there wasn't, the city of Laredo have one rule, Houston have another rule, Austin have another rule, San Antonio. And I thought it was a good idea. Let's have rules statewide, same, that way they can go wherever they want to go. And I knew that it would open up more markets. So, you know, now they're running here in Laredo. Sure. And candidly. I, part of why I did it is that I think it's going to save lives. I think more and more people, you see, they go, hey, you know what, if I'm drinking, I'd rather pay seven bucks to go get an Uber yeah. to come pick me up, take me to the house, I'll come get the car the next day. I think it's going to save lives. So I, I supported that. I voted for it. I think it's going to be good for Laredo. I think it's going to be good for the country, for, for, for the city, that's, for, that's, the, for the that's state. That's one deterrent, right? Yeah. Well, it's and, a, and you need them all. It's an option where people, look, I think that when people are uh, are not drinking before they start to, to drink that day or that night or whatever you think more clearly i mean if you drink a bunch you're going to think less clearly that's what's going to happen so if you if while you're able to think about it you go all right i'm going to download the app i've got it on my phone because everybody's got a phone i've got the app on my phone i can go drink and be comfortable about it because let's say i drink more than i normally do let's say i didn't eat very much then I'm going to press that app, say, I'm at this, come and get me. And you're not going to pay very much. And you're going to avoid hurting yourself, the possible chances. You're going to minimize the chances of hurting yourself, hurting somebody else, right? And so I think it's a, it's a good thing that, uh, that we've got that option. I know it's an excellent. Thank yeah. you for that. But uh, um, what else do you Well, think? you wanted to, you know, we had talked about, uh, you know, on the um, legislation that uh, was pr proposed. There was a bill out there for yeah. equal parenting, more or less. Yes. And uh, whatever happened to that bill? Well, um, it, you know, it was introduced by a good friend of mine, James White. He is a state representative Republican okay. from uh, between Lufkin and Beaumont. He's got okay. that East Texas, deep East Texas area. And uh, buena gente, you know. And he uh, basically what he wanted to do was bring attention to giving parents as much equal rights as they have, as they can, as possible, when parents get divorced, or even if they're not divorced, by the way, but it, but they they have children, a child or, or more than one child. Uh, and, you know, I think a lot of people feel like, I can tell you, a lot of people feel like, you know, so they're... One-track one yeah, one yeah, man. Track you'll track you'll, you'll track hear it, that, yeah. that, that there's a bias one way or another, but, uh, you know, the courts are always going to say this. But the, they'll always say, we want to do what's in the best interest of that child. The best interest of the child. You're going to hear that all the time. And I think the courts, that is their goal. Um, I, I, uh, I think what James was trying to do is to say, look, and he does in the bill. I remember it. I read, I read it. And he's saying, if the court sees that you have two parents, whether they were divorced or, again, out of wedlock, uh, but they both are interested in the child, and the court can see that both parents are responsible and, and can determine, then they should basically be given really equal rights. Now, the way he wrote the bill is he says, one parent would, would not get more than five days a year more than the other parent. So basically, it's, it's equal. So, no, actually, actually, equal parenting, you know, I was on one side of the fence for a yeah. very long time, yeah. and I would see both sides. You, know, yeah. if you have family members that were divorced and students that came in there with, either the father or the mother and, right. and you would see that and I was all, I was on one side and I would always see more complaining of the moms the father doesn't pay child support complaining from the dads I pay child support you don't let me see the kid right and I'm not talking about bad parents because there's bad parents, parents male and female period yeah, yeah. Uh, okay I'm talking about parents that kind of care you know is well it's what's going on and all of a sudden, I crossed to that side of the field several yeah. years ago. Yeah. And then I started seeing myself like, wait a minute, you know, I'm not treating more like a criminal from from the court and stuff like that because the decree wasn't signed for many months, many and actually yeah. several years. And uh, you, you're you're lawless. Yeah. You're basically lawless. You're well you're when it's in, when it's in limbo like that. You you want to try to, and that's one of the things that the the court look at, and and the and the parents, 
you know, you want to try to establish as quickly as possible. possible. If, look, if there's going to be a divorce, and let's face it, we have divorces yeah, in this country. The, the figure I've seen is, you know, 50% of the marriages end up in divorce. You get a lot of divorces, and you have a lot of children who are born out of wedlock. And you also will have even the children that are born out of wedlock, where, and it's usually going to be obviously the father, right? Yeah. The father says, I, I want to get involved in this child's sure. life. Of course. And so you want that. We want that in society. We want, let me tell you something, I'll never forget when I first got elected, and bef but before I took office, I went up to Austin, they had a panel up there talk on education. They had a, a school board member, they had a superintendent, they had a parent, they had peop a couple of people from the private sector, and it was very interesting. It was packed, it was very interesting. And at the very end of it, the, the moderator asked the question, if there's one thing you could have more of, uh, what would it be? in terms of the child succeeding. Just one thing, write it down. All of them wrote the same thing. They said more, more parental, parental involvement. involvement. Of course. And the, the government it. can't do anything about that, no, right? I, you know, I, I see that. You know, the, uh, I see that many people get, uh, they forget about life and do work. Yeah. Many, many people do that. Right. And all of a sudden, um, what's the name of that, that song, you know, The Cat in the Cradle? Yeah, The Cat in the Cradle, yeah, yeah. And, Cat and, Stevens. And, and, and it, it happens. Yeah. It happens. So you go throughout life working and trying to make a betterment for your child, and you realize your child's not a teenager. Right. That happens. Right. So what I'm trying to say is there's people that want to be involved. I've seen kids that go into my school, and we've taught many, and the ones that have both parents involved have a little bit more self-esteem. A little bit more confidence, have a little bit more discipline. Man, you get to see, yeah, you so you see it. See, man. I mean, I see it right there. Then you get the kids that that are on one side. And you know they're kind of, and you're like, you try to help every single one of them. Yeah. I wish I could help more. Yeah. I wish. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And um, we have great kids that come in, and um, so I see a difference between a the boy that has or a child that is raised by yeah, both, right. or the both are involved, than one that is not. You see that. So what I think that Representative White, clearly what he's trying to do with this is say, look, we want to give the courts even more ability when you have both parents that want to be involved, to get involved, and when you have both of them that really want to be involved equally, mm -hmm. that, that, we, that we really strive for that because then you have evidence like what you have seen where you have both parents involved. Now let me be clear, and I want to be clear on this, because there are a lot of parents that aren't involved. There are a lot of guys that have kids out of wedlock. They don't want to pay, and then we, they don't want to help them. I, you know, I don't even know if it's my, if that's my baby. Okay, well, we're going to find out. That, we're going to find and, out real quick. And it used to be years ago, man. They'd have to take blood from you. Now, they it's just a take swab, so and that's it. That's, that's it, baby. So they, they find out pretty easily, okay? And so, but then they're, they, then they, oh, que si, que no, and, you know, and they don't help. And then the state has to come in, the attorney general, through the child support division, and we got to go file with the court and say, hey, man, this is your kid. It's already been established. Why aren't you helping? We wish you would help raise that kid, but if you're not going to do that, if you're not going to go spend time with him like you're talking yeah. about, at least you got to help that kid. Financially. That's, that's yeah. your kid, yeah. man. Put food in their mouth. Put clothes on their, on their and back. And I'm in full agreement with that. And uh, we, don't have, we have, like I said, I went in, in there when I first got divorced, and they said, well, after they signed the decree, you have to come in here and sign yeah. up, and you go into the. F and I was just listening to everybody that was there, and uh, there was one guy there that had 17 kids. Wow. With nine different worlds. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> what the hell, you know. And the thing about, about it, you the know, thing about uh, it, Paul, is con condoms don't cost that. So, 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 Paul, know. the thing about it, and this is why I feel strongly about it, if you if you're irresponsible, you don't want to. Especially, let me tell you this, let's back up, forget that guy. But the ones that have the means, they got a good job, they got good pay, they got they own and they, two and houses. They don't, and they don't and, help and, out. And, and they don't help. And the state's got to come and make you do it, man? Come on, man. Because let me tell you, when they don't, then guess who picks up the bill? We do. The public? That's not fair. And that's what I'm talking about. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very supportive. I've always worked very closely with the Attorney General. Cornyn, when he was Attorney General, sure. Uh, uh, Abbott, I worked very closely with Abbott. That's where we really got to know each other. And then now Paxton, who you know he served with me in the House, good friend. So they they do they do they try hard, man. Uh, but but I also believe that what Representative White did here, where he, he's saying, you got two parents that do want to be involved in that kid's life, and and they are responsible. Then judge, 
we want to give you the, the ability to say 50 50. Uh, work, work it out. You work know, it work out. It out. 50 /50. You know, um, we had several folks that, that have come in with father's rights and yeah. parental equality. Rep, uh, you know, they're advocates of that. Yeah. And one of them came out with a good point. And he says, if you all are going to go to divorce, don't go to family court and get a civil lawyer. And write out the contract, how everything's supposed to be, then divorce. You can, you can do that. Yeah. And, and that's the best yes. thing that he ever said. You know, because number one, if you both love the kids, yeah. who cares about your differences? You both love your kids and want to be involved in the kids. That's the only way we can go. And you can do and you can do that, Paul, because then it's like you can sit down and say, Okay, we're gonna make an agreement and if both sides agree. Yeah. It's that's gonna it. it's gonna go forward. It's gonna go you forward. Know? And that's what needs to happen. I think uh, maybe this time around that bill didn't pass. Yeah. But I think next time around maybe you well, I think push it's, it forward. I think we're <clears throat> I think we have to look at, at, at things like that because at the end of the day, I think all he's really doing there is saying, I'm trying to give the courts more ability when they see it. Because he's clear in the bill. If the judge sees, and he says, best interest of the child. And if you see, I've got two parents here that really uh, are, are, are loving. They both want to be involved. They're both willing to do their, be responsible. We know that that's good for that kid, man. Who doesn't love their father and their that's mother? A, that's exactly right. And that's just the way it is. Don't let it, don't let a child start dividing. Exactly. Or be divided. Well, because it happens. But, uh, be, be divided uh, because that, look, one of my, one of my best buddies, this is, I got thrown into a dorm room with him up in, in UT. Brilliant guy, man. Guy from Houston. Brilliant guy. Man, I never forget it. So, you know, once we got to be friends, and we're still friends. I just talked to him two days ago. Uh, and I remember him telling me when, that his parents got divorced when he was 10 years old. And he had to go to court, dude. They put him on the stand, and they asked him, who do you want to stay with? That's tough, man. Oh, yeah. And yeah. by the way, he stayed with his father. Yeah. Okay. And Which is a good example about don't assume, yeah, don't make assumptions. But 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 he said most. He said I hated it. Mo most uh, most that I've gotten of, of what I've seen that have been thrown up in court. Yeah. Most boys, most lads, that you get thrown up in court. And you say, who are you going to pick? They're going to pick the father. And but it's still a tough it's, deal because you know they love their deal, mother. You know, but it's uh, unfortunately that's what happens. The yeah. statistics of it, you know, the, yeah, yeah. the numbers, the numbers show. But, it, but it, it gets back to what you said, which is you, you don't want to divide them. You don't want to divide them. Man. It's not about King, King Solomon, you know. Yeah. Kind of being, exactly. You know, it's about working together. Yeah, yeah. And that's the way that's the way it should be. Now, um, you know, and that subject. Hopefully, you all can come together and pass that bill forward and make. Well, I, I hope we can. I hope we can do something with. And that one, I, I mean, I read it. I, mean, I think I, don't know, I wonder why. It didn't pass, but you know there, there are interests out there that uh, you can you can introduce the best bill in the world, but there's always going to be somebody against it. Of course. And there, as we say in the legislature, there are a thousand ways to kill a bill, and there's only one, only one way to pass it. It's a lot easier to kill a bill than it is to pass a bill, and I know that. I've, I've worked very hard to you know to do both things: to kill somebody's bill that I thought was a bad idea, and and to pass things that I thought were good ideas. So it, it takes a lot of work. I remember one that I passed three times four times out of the house finally the fourth time it got it got to the governor and and um, and he and he signed it one I passed it out of the house the Senate didn't pass it two I passed it out of the house again the Senate didn't pass it the third time I passed it Senate passes it governor vetoes it the fourth time I passed it out of the house Senate and, go and governor signs it <laughs> and it was I'll tell you what it was because I think it's very interesting it came to my attention that we have lawsuits that are filed so, for example, uh, I'll give you an example, man. Um, th this was in California. The school teacher, this, this was after the Columbine shootings in Colorado. Remember that? Terrible deal. So this teacher, she hears two students talk about they're going to bring guns to school tomorrow. She calls the sheriff. She says, hey, these guys just said this high school. So, of course, the sheriff's department, they go talk to these guys. They go talk to the parents. So her, the parents of those kids sue the teacher for libel and slander. Now, this is important. That teacher didn't go have a press conference and tell the whole world. She reported to the, the authorities and said, this is what I heard. And, and that was responsible. But what she was having to deal with is that you had laws that allowed the parents to go sue for libel and slander. You had another, what I would hear about, I'll tell you what, what I can remember, is how it first came to my attention is, I had a guy up in Dallas. He heard somebody on a radio show many times, oh, several times, and they started using using a lot of racial slurs, profanity, really bad. 
But he got tired of it, so he filed, He knew that that was against the FCC rules. He filed a complaint. He didn't have a press conference. He filed a complaint with the Federal Communications Commission. They sued him. So he had to spend thousands of dollars in, in court defending himself. And so what we so you started seeing states pass these laws, and that's what I did, which is that if somebody goes and files a proper complaint with an agency, like a law enforcement agency, or whatever, sure. and they should uh, be and then they get then they sue them and say, Oh, libel and slander, you're slandering me, then that what my bill does is it allows the court to take up the case immediately and to look at summary judgment, what we call summary judgment. So that the judge can say, no, this person did not slander you. They went and reported it to the sheriff. They went and reported it to the FCC, they re whatever. And so I'm dismissing it. I say, Cabo. And then it says, and if I see, if the, if the judge looks at it and says, wait a minute, company, you did it, or person, whatever, you did it just to jerk with Paul, I'm going to charge you maliciously, yeah? Yeah, three or four times legal attorney's fees. And um, and so, it's a very good bill. It's a good well, law. It's a, it's it, a good law be, because yeah, it took me four times, but finally yeah. the governor. You know, you, you, you need stuff like that. Well, you, you need, do because you you, stuff like that. you want people to, you know. Now, now let me be clear. If if you file a complaint like with the sheriff or PDA, I saw somebody. You know, somebody was over there burning down a, a house or whatever. I, I I saw them. I mean, uh, yeah. this can't be right. And and then you go have a press conference and tell everybody. They can still sue you because that's different. That's a different then story. you're you're up there hurting their reputation. But if you go file a complaint, which is it's going to be quiet, it, 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 they're not going to nobody's going to know about it unless you've done something wrong and then they file charges against you. Then it becomes public. But at that point, obviously, the agency, the law enforcement agency, or whatever, came to the conclusion: Hey, this person did something wrong. Mm -hmm. So it does not affect. It does not protect somebody that just wants to go slander Malici you. Maliciously. Maliciously, yes, absolutely. But it protects somebody that... In bad faith is a legal right. term. If they do it in bad faith, then, you know... Um, but it'll protect somebody that's doing it... As for a, the right for reasons. The re yeah, exactly. For the right reasons, man. You know, and I, I just... <coughs> that's like a precautionary that, thing. Like right? that teacher. My mother was a teacher for 35 years. So when I heard about that, I'm like... All of a sudden, that teacher's got to pay a bunch of lawyers and stuff to... I mean, it, it just... Anyway, so it... it it takes time, you know, sometimes to pass things. And James, this is a very sensitive issue uh, about parental rights and so forth. So we will look at it carefully. But I do think that we have to continually strive to do what's good for that kid. And I promise you, if you've got two parents that the court says... Work, that are willing to work, yeah. they have to allow them to work together. Yeah, absolutely. That's just, the way, that's just the way it is. It's going to be the best thing for the kid. That's and, the bottom line. Yeah, so. Yeah, and, uh, and, but let's talk about the, you, you mentioned before we got on here about, you know, what happened in Las Vegas. Oh, Jesus. That's horrific. And uh, you have it coming on both sides, and both sides are going to start tooting their horn. Well, uh, and this is not about a political issue. It isn't. This is about a safety issue. And, you know, they say that he took so many guns inside. Some say 10, some say 7. Some, right. someone, there's a, I was reading 15. How can you carry you? You and I hunt. <laughs> how can you carry through the hallway so many guns and not yeah, be recorded that's somewhere? That's I mean, I, that's to me, it's kind of like. But all sorts of stuff. We can go off in conspiracy theories. Well, and right. Let, but, let me, uh, I want to jump in on this. Everybody, re you'll remember yeah. the Newtown shooting, right? Sure. Where Newtown, Connecticut, where all the elementary school, all these children got killed. It was terrible, man. So right after that, that happened in December. Sandy Hook, was it? Sandy Hook uh, Elementary. So immediately, that was December, immediately you start having the gun debate, okay? too many guns or too many rounds in a clip or whatever. And I, I wrote a, an opinion editorial. I sent it to Houston Chronicle. They ran it all over the place. And I said, look, you know, I'm a Democrat. I'm a strong Democrat. I've been shooting guns since I was a kid. The first deer I killed, was I was eight years old. Yeah. He's hanging in my Capitol office. He's there, man. I killed yeah. that buck when I was eight. And, and so I said, but let me tell you what I've seen all my life is whenever we have something like this, I mean, I think every time that person had a mental illness. It's not about the gun. Uh, do we have to be responsible with guns? Absolutely. And that and, was and proven. Yes. That was proven. Well, and Adam that Lanza, that kid, he really had some yeah, mental issues. issues. And so, so I said back then, I said, we need to move away and not make it about that. We can debate, you know, okay, if you want to, what kind of guns, whatever, fine. But don't make this event. You don't make. Don't move the, the debate on on whether we should have 
13 rounds in a clip or 10 rounds in a clip or 7 rounds in a clip. Look, if you put 7 rounds in a clip instead of 13, I'll get, I'll get 2 or 3 clips. So it's not about the clip. It's exactly it, right. It's about the guy that was holding the gun and what, what happened up here. The, unfortunately, right, uh, these people are people that have mental illness. It, it'll be interesting when we can find out what happened with this with this guy up in, in Las Vegas. But that was horrible, man. But who in their right mind You know what's does worse? That? It's the tweets. Yeah. That, in, you know, have, uh, he went in there and he shot a bunch of Republicans because they like country music. Wait a minute. What the <laughs> hell is that? I like okay. country music. You know what, you know what I'm love saying? Country music. Like, <laughs> you know, so, but that hate is out there, and we have to somehow squash that hate. Yes, yes. And we have to come down, and we had a bunch of hate here in Texas, everywhere. Yeah. And it took a natural disaster to unify everybody. Yeah. We don't want, let's turn that into this. And you know what? Let's unify everybody and, I, and, I'm and telling let's you, do Paul, stuff correctly. I'm telling you, Paul, what I wrote in that opinion editorial, and I'm very proud of this, by the way. This was four years ago. So I said, we need to invest more in mental health. Of course. Okay? That's the issue. Okay? And I was very proud. I wrote that in January. And that session, we increased at the state level uh, um, more than we'd ever done for mental health in the state of Texas because we have a lot of people. For example, the sheriff will tell you, the sheriffs all over the state will tell you, a lot of people they arrest, they come in and they have a mental illness. Well, the sheriff's department, that's not what they're there for, right? To help deal with mental illness, but that's their reality. Yeah, and so, so you know, I was very proud that my pushing it like that got us to invest a lot more in mental health care. But for example, in Washington, what I wrote back then, I said, if President Obama and the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell got together instead of arguing about guns, said, "We're going to invest another five billion dollars in mental health care in America for mental illness." it would have passed with everybody voting for it. And it would have brought us together in recognizing that Adam Lanza, who went in there at Sandy Hook Elementary, pobrecito, he had some mental problems. And, and, that, and then you end up having this terrible disaster. I have to think that when we, once we find out more about what happened in Las Vegas, who in their right mind, Paul, takes five, 10, 20 rifles up to 32nd floor story. And start shooting. And, 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 and obviously and premeditated because you're like, on the, you, you know how that goes. You go to a hotel that's got two sides. You go, hey, can you uh, give me a hotel room on that side because I'd like to look out to that side as opposed to the other side, right? This was premeditated. Straight. I mean, oh, I mean, terrible, I'm, man. I just, um, you know what will be effective if, to end all this yeah. is forensics on the sound of, the, the guns that were used. Yeah. Then we can f kind of figure out and end all these conspiracy theories. Right. Because that's the only way. The, the, you know, sounds of bullets and right. different r rifles have fingerprints. Right. Kind of like fingerprints. Sure. And, you, and they can. And I'm sure some people ended up recording after I'm a little while, sure, right? Yeah. They started. Well, first of all, there's probably somebody standing there recording the singer. There's, there's a bunch of guys recording. Yeah. So, but anyway, um, but that mental health is, issue is, is is needed. I'll it's tell important. you a story. Uh, right after. I had just opened up the school in, in Dallas because I had my school in Dallas yeah. for a while. We had a lot of veterans that were Navy. Navy. We have Grand Prairie Naval Base, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is an air base. And we had a a veteran, you know, young guy. We used to call him local because he was a little off. And uh, nicest guy. We didn't know that he was really off because of the service mm -hmm. until he was thrown in jail. And he was stopped and by a police officer and her. And uh, they said, okay, you know, he's very hyper. Are you drunk? Are you on drugs? Do the test. And he said, can you all walk on your hands? So he started walking on his hands in the, in the in I-83, you know. So they, come on, you know, handcuffs, you're going. <laughs> you know, so he started, and once it's at the hospital, once it's at there, they started yeah. figuring out, guess what? You haven't been taking your medication for the longest time. And he spent some time in Grand Perry, uh VA, yeah, and that's when we knew that. Guess what? He did not have money. Right. He didn't. He couldn't hold a job. He couldn't buy his medication. He wasn't going to the VA. So. Well. But, you know that those are just. We we uh, have to, but it's a good example of where. I gotta you know, mention another another little bill that I passed that I'm also proud of. I mentioned that when I put the words in God we trust up in the in the House chamber, well. 
I drive back and forth from Laredo to Austin all the time, right? I mean, from the time I was in college to now. And so I'm always, you know. See license plates? You see license plates. From every, from, first of all, from all over the place. But you also see my loved, my beloved Dallas Cowboys. You know, you'll see University of Texas. You'll see A&M. You'll see a deer. You'll see a horned toad. You'll see nobody, everything. I mean everything. And one day, I'm going like, I don't remember what I saw that got me to thinking. But it's something that I thought was pretty silly. I said, man, we got to give people a chance to put in God we trust on the license plate. So I passed the bill, and we finally announced that people could start ordering them, right? And, you know, um, when you do one of those license plates, when you pass a bill for one of those license plates, one of the things that you can do, and I did it in the bill, if you buy a license plate and you want to put in God we trust on there, you're going to pay an extra $30. 22 of those dollars, eight of them are going to be just to process it, right? But 22 of those dollars... I, I had to make a decision what I was going to do with it, so I put in there to give it to the Veterans Commission. Of course. I work a lot with the Veterans Commission. Yeah. I have for many years. Every dollar that we give them, Paul, every dollar that we give them, they bring down, on average, $10 to help that comes from the VA, from the, from the Veterans Administration, to help that veteran in the state of Texas. It's a great, great investment. I have a, an, another student of mine. His name is, he's actually a lieutenant uh, commander. Mm -hmm. His name is Patrick Gavin. He's in Chicago. And he started a Wounded Warriors. Yes. And he's teaching Savat to the Wounded Warriors. And I've talked to him. Some of them are young guys with missing limbs. Yeah. And through Savat and through those programs, we're picking them up, you know. And we need that. We need that. Yes. I mean, these men gave, some of them gave their lives for our freedom. And sometimes they come back and they think that we're not backing them up. We're backing you up. Many of us are. We, we got to back them up, man. And that we're helping you. We're right. We're standing right there next to you. And we're. I we're, mean, we appreciate that you sacrificed for the red, white, and blue. And 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 getting to your point about, you know, why I'm proud that I did that. That's going to get them several million dollars more a year from from the license plate. That's going to turn into ten times as much. But many of those veterans, and they'll tell you, they need help. Of course. I, I'm 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 not I'm not going to tell you his name, but. I, I um, talked to somebody the other day, and he, he is a veteran, and he was a, um, a POW sure. for several years. And he was talking to, this came to me, talking to one of the one of the judges here in town. And there were at some event, and the judge starts talking to him because the judge's father is a, is a Vietnam veteran. Sure. And so the man says, he mentioned that he's a POW. He'd been a POW for several years. The guy is now in his early 80s. And the judge said, you know, one of the things I think I'd like to do, and I'm going to help the judge with this, is sit down and, and, and record some of you veterans to talk about your experiences, you know, because he said, I want people to understand and I want future generations to know what you guys went through. And the man looked at him, very nice man, like I said, I've talked to him by now. He says, uh, well, I don't really talk about it much, although he said, I, you know, I think I'm getting a little better, but he said, um, he, he didn't find out till like five years ago that he was entitled to assistance. He didn't have, he wasn't missing body parts, but the mental illness, the, 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 the mental effect of yeah, having been a POW. Abuse. And you can imagine what they tr treated him like as a POW. And he said, you know, I, I talked about it a couple of years ago, and he said, man, I, I just had, after I did that, he said I had a lot of bad dreams, I couldn't sleep. He said it was very, very tough. He said, but I think I'm getting better now, so he said I... I, I would like to try that. Yeah. I mean, we're very lucky. We're sitting here, but all my life, since I was a kid, man, veterans have been played such an important role in my life and helping me, and I've, and I've talked to them and, and what they go through. Look, listen about, you know, Chris Kyle, famous sure. Chris Kyle, right? Who Our hero, you know. You know, the champ. I mean, he, he, he you know, a, a modern-day hero. And after all he went through over there, he comes back with a mission to help other veterans who are having a harder time than him. And killed by and, one. And he, he picks one up just to go to the shooting range. The guy kills him. He killed him and, and, and his friend. Yeah, and his friend. I mean, that's horrible, man. But that but that, that Marine, you know, obviously needed some help. And Chris was trying to help him, right? But he needed some professional help. And that's what I think, uh, you know, we need to recognize the veterans too. Is that they they need help, and then this it just makes me sick that this veteran who was a POW didn't know till like five years ago that he was entitled to get some kind of assistance on mental health. Talking about POWs, not changing the subject. Yeah, 
My professor in France, his name was Roger Lafont. He died at 101 years old. He came here to Laredo in 98. And he was a prisoner of war, but he was in Stalingrad. And the Nazis knew that he was a champion of Savant, said, we either kill him or you teach us Savant. So there's pictures of him in Stalingrad teaching the Nazis really? for the prisoners of war to have better meals. And wow, he was an man. old, he was, he, you know, he passed away. So what a story, man. And I'll show you the picture. I'll give you one. Yeah, man, that'd be great. Him. But, uh, you know, because... Hey, Amen. You know, that's just the way it was. Gonna big up. It yeah. looked like uh, John McCain. I want to mention John McCain because I, through the years, I've had a chance to meet him many times. You know, again, he's a Republican. I'm a Democrat. But here's a guy that's, that was a POW for seven years, Paul. Seven years. His father was an admiral. His grandfather was an admiral. When the Vietnamese found out, oh, this is the John McCain, because he's John McCain the third. So John McCain, his father, and his grandfather. Oh, so your father is one of the famous admirals, que este que el otro, you know? And they wanted to release him to, to make them a good PR for the Vietnamese. Hey, we released the son of the admiral. And John McCain said, I will not be released until everybody in this camp is released. Dude, can you imagine? I mean, they broke his back, they broke his arms, they broke his fingers, they broke, beat the hell out of him, and he could have walked out of there. And he said, I'm not leaving until everybody can leave. I don't care whatever else John McCain has done, will you agree or don't sure. agree with him? Sure, I, I'd like to know how many guys sitting in Washington. I've gotten their bones broken in, in the I'd like to know how many guys sitting in Washington would have done what John McCain did when they said, hey, you can go. No. So he said another three years, dude. An extra three years until they released everybody. Wow. So you want to? Somebody wants to complain about John McCain because they don't they don't like the way he voted on this or that. Well, you know what? Before you do that, man, you ask yourself what you would have done if you were a prisoner of war. Of course. You ask yourself. The, the, major this, the majority would have said, "Hell yeah!" Oh yeah. Know, oh, I'll go home and right I'll, now, I'll go home and I'll start telling everybody, "Hey, we need to get these guys released." You know, I mean. I read that many years ago. I, I read about him when he was a congressman, when he first got elected to the Senate. That's when I first read about all yeah. that. I'm like, you know what, yeah, whatever you do, dude, I, I, I will. I got your back. Yeah, man. I mean, how can you? So I, I don't like, I don't like when somebody criticizes. If you want to say, hey, I don't, I don't agree with his vote, or I don't agree that he did that. But don't get personal with him, man. Don't call him a coward. Don't call him, you know. It's like the, all the kneelers in yeah. the football now. Yeah. Come on, do you want to protest? You want to protest the police? Go to City Hall. There are a lot of other ways, ways to do it than to disrespect the flag of everybody, because that same flag that gives you freedom is the same flag that gives freedom to you, me, and there's yeah. a lot of people out there. That same flag. That it's it's a soul. very Paul. That's it's a very sensitive deal. People have asked me what I did. Look, if if I were on an NFL team, first of all, I, I would want it to be the Cowboys. Let me be very clear. Sure. And come hell or high water, um, I would stand. I would stand. Uh, if, if, but it gets back. You know, if if my quarterback or my whoever they want to kneel, you know, I'm not going to agree with it. But that's their right. That's their deal. I hope that. But but, but privately, I mean, I would talk to them. And say, dude, you want to do something? Why don't we do this? Let's go have something. Let's go have a town hall meeting. That's exactly you're right. You're a Let's celebrity. Hey, you're a celebrity. Let's go have a town hall meeting. Bring in some <coughs> police officers. You're there. I'm there. Let's talk about this. Let's bring in folks from the community. You're going to do stuff. You're going to get more done. You're going to get stuff done. Than that way. You know? That's the way I look at it. You want to kneel? The way I look at it is you want to kneel? You want to disrespect? You're the one that's disrespecting. Not I. It's we'll a, do what a, you want to do. It's a tough deal. You want to protest? Yeah. I'll be right there with you protesting. Yeah. I guess I, 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 I got to tell you, I, I, I feel like, uh, you know, it, it, it is a very sensitive deal, yeah. but I I liked what the Cowboys did. They and nailed they, and then they stood. They said, we're all going to kneel together before the national anthem, but we're going to show and we're going to lock arms that we, we get the, the concerns you have because there are some bad seeds out there. We know that. And we get that. And I, I got to tell you, I loved it when I saw Jerry Jones. And he's got Jason Witten over here, and he's, you know, and they're there. And then they all stood up for the national anthem. And, um, but they can do more in the town hall meetings. They Absolutely. can do more for that. And police brutality exists. 
Well, not with you. They're not going to mess with you, man. No, it, it, <laughs> that, but it exists. And what, and what, and what happens and, uh, is very simple. You have police officers that complain against others, and then they're the ones that are getting the hard deal. Yeah. They get blackballed in the system. Yeah. Well, that's true. You, you know, you, we you, have to you, do something there that has to protect the police officer. I don't think. Yeah. I don't think there's any bill that protects that law, man, for who, complaining against the other one. something, something wrong. wrong. Instead you of know, being. That's a really good point. Man. Then, you know, that continue. is. This is. I'm glad, Sergio. I'm glad we're doing this. I'm going to follow up on that because there's none. Because you got to give those guys that see something bad where they're not. We're going to blackball you. We're going to slash your tires. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And I and I had not heard anybody talk about that. You see, you see, especially here in Laredo, because we have so many different departments. We have constables, and we have four of them, and they all do a great job. The sheriffs and police, and so forth. You get a police officer that's abusive. He doesn't get fired. They don't remove his license. He gets all of a sudden he's a constable. He does something there. Up, oh, oh, he went over there to the other constable. And now he's taking care of our kids in UISD. Oh, now he's a sheriff. So they're playing musical chairs with these peace officers that are actually abusing the, under the color of law. Right. And that has to stop. Well, what I think, this, this is what I think. I think that law enforcement officers, they're going to want, look, the, these guys go sign up. They want to protect the community, right? And so if it's, it's a matter of pride with these guys. Sure. If they see a guy who's doing something they shouldn't do, it, it, they know that it, it shines on them. And they're not going to want that. But what we need is what, what I believe you brought up, and I'm going to check into this, is when a, when a good cop sees somebody doing something they know they're not supposed to do, they've got to be able to, to be do, protected To be protected when they, when they say, hey, this happened, this guy, it's wrong, and, and I, need to, I need somebody to know because we're not like that, I'm not like that. But we've got to make sure that uh, – yeah, I'm going to talk to some PD guys about this. I'm glad you brought it up. And see, they've got some ideas. Here's something that I did several several years ago. I've always taught police agencies and so on and so forth, and yeah. from knife, knife, the ways you use a knife, defense against the knife, and so on and so forth. Not only here, in other countries. Yeah. Um, I used to teach several police officers here, about 15 of them. And uh, this one Monday, we we're talking about knives, retentions of knives, and where to hit and all of this. I think I was t talking about striking towards the heart, you know, trying to drop the person. Yeah. And we were practicing that for several weeks. And then one Monday, I came in at noon, and everybody was laughing. And I said, um, true story. And um, I said, what's going on? He goes, you know, Prof, what you showed us works. What did I show you? You know, what we were talking about. They all started doing, oh, I dropped the person like this and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, how was he attacked? Because I'm more yeah. into it. You know, what happened? And they all were laughing. And one of the guys, and I go, what's going on? What, why are you laughing? He goes, he was handcuffed. And I stopped and I said, you know what? You all didn't do diddly squat. See that door? Don't come back. I'm not here to teach you guys to be beating up people that are handcuffed. Right. I'm here to be protecting yourselves and others. It's always about self-defense. And then all of a sudden I said, now for about five years, I didn't teach any police officer from here. Then a young man came in that had done four tours in Afghanistan, state trooper, and he said, can you teach me? I said, sure. And that's how we started back again. Mm -hmm. But I've seen those, that little group that was there, and they've done the musical chairs everywhere. And when you kind of find out what's going on, well, they've never stopped that little habit. You know, so we need to place something in there that's going to protect the good officer from pointing out, from pointing out that this, whether it's an agency that he goes to, or not really, they're in the same agency. You know what, Chief, so and so is getting, was beating so and so up. Well, the chief's going to call the other guy. Hey, I was told by this guy that, right. he, and all of a sudden you get blackballed. Right. So it's not really within the agency. There has to be something in the state agency that they can it go to. It might be, yeah, it has the, to the be, DPS you know, or something. You know, DPS. Yeah, yeah. Yes, well, I'm going gonna, gonna to follow up on that, and I am going to visit with some officers and, and the chief. We've got a new chief. He's a great guy. He's a good guy. Uh, Claudio Trevino. Uh, and, you know, I mean, we, all, we have great, great, uh, not, not any public Well, I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna, and I'm going to ask our sheriff. I mean, he, as yeah. you know, uh, Sheriff Cuad, Martin Cuad, he's been law enforcement all his life. Sure. He was with DPS all those years, lieutenant. Sure. 
he he. he I'm gonna, Gars, I'm Chief Gars, I think, has uh, and, and he's also yeah. great to point out that absolutely, absolutely, and sit with them apart. Actually, sit with every single one of them. Yeah, together and say, what can we come? Yeah, up with? what what can we do to help your guys? Because they're the heads. They're going to want it to be a clean department. They're going to want it to be the, the your mission is to to serve and protect. Bottom line. Yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. I think that'll be excellent for the whole state. Of absolutely, yeah. And not yeah. only this state for federally, well, it, it could it, happen federally. It, be it could shit. be, but it could be something that again, it it comes out of the frustration that some of these players and other people have felt. Look, you look at some of those videos the last two, three years. Okay, guys, have got. I mean, what happened here with a young guy that had autism? Got shot how many times? Yeah. 60, 70, yeah. you know. After he told them I'm selling a pellet gun, they went over there and high five. I mean, I've seen the video. I mean, it was on YouTube, and you're like, I see the frustrations, not of everybody. Yeah. You know, and, and what happens is that uh, everybody that's from inner city ethnic group, you can be Irish from the Irish yeah. city town. Depends where you're at. Of course, blacks. Yeah, yeah. Latinos of all sorts, depending on where you're. The well, the Zoot suits. Uh, you, yeah, you know, you hear about L.A. in the 40s, the Zoot suits. I mean, yeah. they were targeting Mexican Americans, I mean, bad, bad. You know, I mean, we will. Everybody's been through it, and it, it's just—it's not right, no matter who's happening. Exactly to. right. So that has something that has to be stopped, and I think our own police departments know we have great lawmen, we have great peace officers, but it's always these bad apples that make the whole department look bad. Yeah. And if those good officers understand that they're going to be protected by law. I think it's a I better deal. This so, thing, this well, I'm, I'm going to right? run with it, and I'll get back with you. But I'm going to run with that and check I on it and see if there's good. something we can do. And you know, um, it, it, you know, if there's something we can do, I mean, I'll get it. I'll get it to yeah, to, no, to no, Jerry course. Jones and say, hey, by the way, you know, maybe you guys can talk about this and, and support this. We work with law enforcement, work with the community. But I'm going to follow up on that. Yes, sir. Any other great ideas? Because that's a good no, idea. No, no, no. <laughs> you, you're the one. You're the, you're, you're the one. That's hey, listen. This. I try to come up with ideas, but one of the things that I've always said is that two heads are better than one, and three are better than two. Yeah, of course. You get more ideas. I mean, nobody knows everything. I, I've always told you know. Sometimes when I'm with someone that they, they, they think they're really smart and they they, they want to be the smartest guy in the room, I always say I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room. I just want the smartest guy to be in the room. That's correct. Right? right, man or woman, right? Because that's you get ideas, and that's what it's about. Well, good well, to be with you, man. Thank Enjoyed you. it. Thank yes, you. sir. All right. All right. We'll be back. Thank you. Until next time. <laughs> we'll be back. We're good. Until next time, we'll see you.